Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum dear participants. We do apologize for this inconvenience. Uh, the computer got stuck and we had to restart it. So it took some more time. Uh, so we are going to start a new topic today under the title of Mizan lecture series. Uh, as you would all recall and uh, I'm sure clearly remember that this lecture series is based on Ustaz Yaweh Ahmad Ghamadi's book Mizan, which itself is uh, his understanding of the contents of Islam. Uh, the topic that we are going to begin today is called the Framework of Islam and it is the second preamble of his book. Uh, the reason that we will be studying this uh, topic at this instance is that basically this is his own interpretation of the contents of Islam arranged in a structure, in a framework and as such it represents his original contribution. Uh, aside from his own uh, complete interpretation of uh, the contents of Islam arranged in a framework, we know that there are two other prominent uh, interpretations we can say or frameworks that have been suggested by scholars. So one of them, the more famous one and the more predominant among Muslims is the Tasawwuf framework, uh, which is put forth by our Sufi scholars and of course uh, Ibn al-Arabi, Imam Ghazali uh, and later on Shah Waliullah, they can be called the champions of this, uh, this version or we can say this framework of Islam. Then we have a second framework of Islam which culminated in political Islam and it started off with the uh, what we can say as the jihad framework uh, the important people amongst them amongst this framework is Imam Ibn Taymiyyah of course he's the forerunner he's perhaps the founder and uh, it culminated uh, in Ustaz Abu Allah Maududi's uh, own personality who also uh, further refined and took this uh, old framework to a new level and this third framework which is presented by Ustaz uh, Javed Ahmed Ramidi. He says and he claims that this is the framework which uh, is the framework of the Sahaba or the Prophet and he thinks that as far as the other two frameworks works are concerned they are absolutely flawed and uh, they need to be re-evaluated and uh, reconstituted. So today we'll study how he has understood this whole framework and how he has arranged the contents of uh, religion in the form of a structure. Uh, you will see that basically his framework of Islam consists of these 10 broad topics. Uh, yes, we have some individual details that we will study, but broadly you can see these are the 10 uh, structural topics or in other words, these are the prominent points which actually demarcate what exactly Islam stands for. The essence of religion, definition of religion, contents of religion, uh, prophets and messengers, purpose of divine books, the responsibility of Inzar, Islam, which is the name of this religion, Iman, which is the inner aspect of religion. Then we have the ob objective of religion. And finally, the 10th point is the correct religious attitude. So this, these 10 points or these uh, 10 commandments, if you can say, they make up the structure of religion, the framework of religion as understood by Ustaz Javed Ahmad Ghamidi. So now let us start with the first of these topics. Uh, the first of these topics, as you all know, is uh, the essence of Islam or the essence of religion, to be precise, uh, which is presented here. So uh, in one word, Ustaz Ghamidi says that the Quranic term of ibadah or worship is the essence of religion. And it is in reality worship which the creator of this world desires of his servants and creatures. So you can see. The words of the Quran are Wama khalaqtul jinna wal insa illa liyabudun. And I created jinn and mankind only to worship me. Now, some explanation is in order because generally it is thought that, well, uh, what this verse means is that person, that people have been created to pray and to fast and to do other worship rituals as far as uh, God is concerned. But this is not uh, what this verse is telling us. It's not saying that. The Almighty has created jinn and mankind that they start uh, observing these worship rituals. The word used here is liyar budun, and uh, this word actually refers to the fact that at various instances in our times, in our in our lives, uh, in our own routines, we have to regard ourselves to be God's creatures. We have we, we must regard ourselves to be God's servants who are. Uh, humble to him and they have a status of being answerable to him, they have a status of being uh, meek and uh, uh, and not in any case think that they are absolutely, uh, I mean, not dependable on anyone, they are independent and they have their own uh, status, which is not true. So basically the relationship between 
creatures and their God is that of servitude. So if one word that can in essence describe our relationship with the Almighty, which is also the essence of religion, it's servitude, which means that we have to realize that God has created us as, as people who are going to serve his cause, as people who must not override this service, who must never think that they are individuals who are in charge of affairs, but basically they have to acknowledge the greatness of the Almighty, the exaltedness of the Almighty, and their own meekness and civility. At various instances in the Quran, it is mentioned very clearly that the Almighty, He has sent His messengers to inform people of this very reality. So you can see the very next verse, uh, which is now displaying before, displayed before you, is said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَسْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولٍ أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجْتَنِبُ التَّغُوتِ And we raise a messenger in each nation with the message, worship God and keep away from At-Taghut. So, the important thing here to realize is that this, this verse of Surah Nahal, which says that uh, the Almighty has asked us to uh, be in servitude to Him, it actually means that people are asked on the other, on the one hand, to refrain from what is a taghut, and on the other hand, to lead a life of servitude with God before God. Now, a taghut and a shaitan are used synonymously in the Quran. They refer to someone who is arrogant and rebellious before the Almighty, and the ob opposite of this obviously is humility and modesty. So, lexicographers have generally explained worship as, as something which is an amalgam, an embodiment of humility and civility. And the words they generally use are Aslul Arbudiya al khuzu wa tazallul. Aslul Arbudiya al khuzu wa tazallul, which means that the essence of worship or the foundation of worship is humility and civility. So if this humility and civility exists in a person with a true comprehension of the mercy, power, providence, and wisdom of the Almighty, then it is instrumental in totally humbling a person before him uh, with his great love and great fear. So remember, this is what is very important. His great love and his great fear, they go hand in hand. He is not all fear. He is not all love. He is love and fear put together. The Quranic words that we often uh, might come across like khushu or khudu or ikhbat or inaba or khashya, tadarru, khunud, I mean these are all various words. Uh, they are used to depict this very state of a person, his inner state. Now this of course is something which originates from his inner self and which then embraces his outside, his whole self as well. So when this inner humility in, uh, manifests itself in the outer form, then various other manifestations result. So, zikr, which means remembering God to obtain peace and inner satisfaction. Shukr, which means ex expressing immense gratitude to God on his abounding favors. And then taqwa, which is fearing God's anger. Ikhlas, which means to devote oneself entirely to God. Tawakkul, which means to trust God. And tafiz, which means submitting, submitting oneself and all of one's affairs to God. Taslim or raza, that's another uh, aspect which says that we have to be content at all the decisions of God. So all these are the innermost manifestations of this relationship between the worshipped and his worshippers. So when that feeling of humility, it overcomes us, we feel that we are God's uh, I mean, we have to serve God uh, in various capacities and not act as if we are, we have abounding power. So when this happens, then these inner manifestations like zikr and shukr and taqwa and ikhlas, tawakkul, these are attitudes, the fees, the slimu raza, we all discussed this. They, they are these, these are the attitudes that stem from us. And these are the inner manifestations, as I just said, of this relationship between the worship God and his worshippers. In the words of the Quran, this relationship practically manifests itself in some ways. And there is no better or worse than the one that is now being displayed before you, which actually uh, shows these practical manifestations. So remember, we have just seen the inner manifestations, which are taslim or raza and tawakkul and uh, tashakkur, which means to be uh, thankful to God and to remember God. So these were the inner manifestations. So when these inner manifestations they come out of ourselves and we express them, 
then the Quran has actually outlined them in a in a very a very uh, pertinent verse, and that is now being displayed before you. It says, "Innama yu'minu bi ayatina lazina iza zukkiru biha kharu sujjadan wa sabbahu bi hamdi rabbihim wa hum la yastakbirun." تتجافى جنوبهم عن المزاجع يدعون ربهم خوفا وطمعا ومما رزقناهم ينفقون so none profess belief in our revelations except those who when reminded through them prostrate themselves in adoration and give glory to their lord while expressing their gratitude to him and are not rebellious to their lord their backs forsake their beds they pray to their Lord in fear and in hope and who spend in his way from what we gave them. So clearly you can see that this verse, of course, uh, tells us that kneeling, prostration, uh, prostrating ourselves, glorifying him, uh, the Almighty, praising uh, the Almighty, supplicating before him and sacrificing our life and wealth for his liking. All these are the real forms of worship. So, however, once a person is not it's not just mere beliefs he is also he also has a practical side in this world so when this worship actually relates to this practical life as well and in this manner becomes inclusive of obedience so remember all this uh, that we have just studied that this kneeling and prostration uh, prostrating before the almighty and glorifying him etc so all these are basically the real forms of worship but of course since we are not just mere beliefs we, are, we also have a practical side of worship. Now it requires that our outer self also, it prostrates before the Creator, before whom his inner self had prostrated. So his outer self or our outer selves should also become subservient to the Creator, to whom our inner selves had become subservient, to the extent that no aspect of life, no aspect of life should be left out of it. Also, we can say that we should become true servants of the Almighty in every sense of the word. So the word servant actually today, of course, has a different connotation. People who uh, work for people, they are also called servants. But because of the word, that the Arabic word is Abdullah Abd. So the Abd as a person who serves the Almighty. So the servant actually here refers to the fact that he is in the service of the Almighty. He is always doing what is due on him as imposed on him by the Almighty. So, uh, as far as the Quran is concerned, it says, uh, believers, kneel and prostrate yourselves. The words are, Ya ayyuhal lazina ama nurkaru wasjudu wa'budu rabbakum wa'falu al-khayra la'allakum tuflihoon. Believers, kneel and prostrate yourselves and become servants of your Lord and do good deeds that you may succeed. So, this is something that we have to understand that this kneeling and this prostration and uh, becoming uh, God's servicemen, they, these are the outer manifestations of that inner feeling and that inner thing that we call arbudia or what we call worship. So we need, now need to just sum up and say that as far as this essence of worship is concerned, it actually starts off with that inner feeling of khudu at and tazallul, as the as lexicographers often say, which means the feeling of civility and humility before the Almighty, it manifests its form uh, in inner inner forms in the form of zikr and shukr and all these things. And then practically, when we go about it, it is in the form of kneeling and prostrating uh, before the Almighty, and also showing that our outer selves have also now uh, bowed down uh, bowed down before Him, just as our inner self had. Uh, earlier on. Now we come to the next important topic which Ustaz Ghamidi has said and this is uh, this can be classified as the definition of religion. So as far as this definition of religion is concerned we need to also look at it in a, in a perspective in a background. So when worship prescribes metaphysical and ethical bases for this relationship between a servant and his lord, between a serviceman and a lord, it inst and institutes rituals and stipulates bounds and limits to fulfill the requisites of this relationship in this world, then in the terminology of the Quran, this is called religion. Something very important. So I'm just going to, to reiterate that when this worship, the worship that we have just discussed, which is the essence of religion, which is the essence of religion, when it is prescribes metaphysical and ethical basis for this relationship between a servant and his lord. So this is the first thing. 
when there are metaphysical and ethical bases for this relationship, we will discuss them what they are, number one. Secondly, it institutes rituals and stipulates bounds and limits, which is the third thing, to fulfill these, the requisites of this relationship in this world. Then, in the terminology of the Quran, this is called religion. So, it has a metaphysical, metaphysical and ethical basis. And then, there are certain rituals and bounds and limits that must fulfill the requisites of this relationship. And when this happens, then the Quran says that this is what we call religion. The form of this religion which the Almighty has explained to mankind through his prophets is called the true religion or what we can say is Deen al -haq. And it asks his followers to fully adopt it in their lives and not create any divisions in it. So that is what the Quran has said. And the Quran has actually said this in uh, Surah 42, which is Surah Shura and verse 13. Shara alakum mina dini ma was sabihi nuham wal lazi o haina ilaika wama was saina bihi ibrahima wa musa wa isa an akimud dina wala tatafarahufi. He has prescribed for you the same religion which he prescribed for Noha and which we, we have now revealed to you and which we enjoined on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus with the assertion adhere to this religion in your lives and do not create any divisions in it. So, uh, this verse actually tells us the importance and it tells us that this is the religion that was given to all the prophets of God. It is not that uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, was given this religion for the first time and hence it was called Islam. No, this was something that as we will see and we will go on and also see the Quranic verses say so that the same religion was given to all the prophets of mankind. And, and you can clearly see that it starts off with saying that Ma was sabihi Nuha, that Noah was given the same religion as was given Ab to Abraham and to Moses and to Jesus. Uh, and before that, it is said, Shara lakum, O Prophet, he has prescribed for you the same religion. The same religion which he prescribed for Noah and which he we have now revealed to Abraham and Moses and Jesus. So this actually gives us this very, very important reality that religions of all the prophets has been the same. The Almighty has given the same religion to all his prophets. So therefore, if there has been any discrepancy that we can now see, it is only because the final religion or the final edition of religion which was given to Prophet Muhammad is preserved in its original language that we have today in the form of the Quran. The previous scriptures, of course, they also were true versions of God's religion, but over a period of time, their original language could not be preserved. They could not be, in fact, preserved in their original language and they were lost to posterity. But when the institution of prophethood was to be terminated, the Almighty sent his final prophet with this final book and also he made an arrangement that this final book should be preserved so that no more corruption, no more interpolation or no more deviation can result. The message of God is complete. So, this also tells us that as far as previous books are concerned, they also are God's representations of religion. The only thing is that we don't have them in their original language, so they must be read, but read in the light of the Quran. And wherever there is a discrepancy between them and the Quran, then the Quran will prevail over them. But at the same time, if you have practically read the previous scriptures, you'll find that a quite a large part of these scriptures is in conformity with the Quran and hence. It is highly advisable that we keep consulting uh, these previous scriptures and as we go along, we will find uh, that this is such an important uh, area of Quranic studies that a person who studies the Quran without recourse to the previous scriptures, his study would be bereft of many, many important realities. So the next thing that we will now study uh, regarding the framework of Islam is the content or the contents of religion uh, that we can say. So, uh, so the metaphysical and ethical basis of this worship have been prescribed by religion as al-hikmah. So remember we just said that this religion has metaphysical and ethical basis. So, of, of, and that is what we call al-hikmah. And it also stipulates certain rules and laws that we will just see. But as far as these metaphysical and ethical bases are concerned, they are called al-hikmah. And the rituals and the, and the bounds and limits which we just discussed. Remember that worship, that is the inner aspect of religion, the essence of religion. It, when it prescribes certain boundaries which are 
rituals which connect us to God and limits, then what happens is that there is a whole uh, set of laws that come into being. And that is what is called Al-Kitab by the Quran. So remember, Al-Hikmah are the metaphysical and ethical basis of this worship. And Al-Kitab are the rituals and the bounds and limits which are prescribed by religion. And the Quran has actually put them forth in various verses. For example, you can see, وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَزِيمًا And God has revealed to you Al-Kitab and Al-Hikmah and in this manner taught you what you did not know before. And great is God's favor upon you. And great is God's favor upon you. So, as you can clearly see, أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ So, Al-Kitab and Al-Hikmah Basically, they constitute two parts of religion. So, in other words, we can say the religion which has been given to all prophets of God had two, two sections. The so one of them is Al-Hikmah, which of course relates to the metaphysical and ethical basis of religion, which of course is called morality. And the other is the laws and the rituals, as well as the limits. So, that is called Al-Kitab. So, Al-Kitab and Al-Hikmah. In other words, in, in which this uh, exactly the same content is reflected is also Yes, now you can see before you it says waskuru ni'matullahi alaykum wa ma anzala alaykum min al-kitab wal hikma ya'izukum bi wa taqullah wa a'lamu anna Allah bi kulli shay'in alim and remember the favors he has bestowed upon you and the al-kitab and al-hikma which he has revealed to you of which he instructs you and keep fearing Allah and know that he has knowledge of all things now, the Quran also refers to Al-Kitab as a Sharia. So, remember Al-Hikmah has the same name. I mean, it is called Al-Hikmah. It has just one name. The word Al-Kitab has, has actually two names. So, it has, it has a synonym which is called a Sharia. And this is also something which is the Quran, which the Quran has uh, pointed out. So, it says, Summa ja'alnaka ala shariyatim min al-amr fattabi'ha wa la tattabi' ahwa al lazina la ya'lamoon. Then we set you on a clear sharia regarding religion. So follow it and do not yield to the desires of men who know not. Now, al-hikmah has always remained the same in all revealed religions. However, the sharia has remained different due to evolution and change in human civilizations and society. Now, this is a point that you must understand very clearly and grasp it. That So we have two divisions of religion. We have two parts of religion. One is Al-Hikmah, the other is Ash-Sharia or Al-Kitab. So Ash-Sharia and Al-Kitab are the same. As far as Al-Hikmah is concerned, it has always remained the same. There is no change in all the religions. So in Judaism, in Christianity, as they were later came to be, as Islam later came to be called in, the, in, in their times, in, in this regard, Al-Hikmah has always remained the same. But the Sharia has, has changed. It has evolved because of a change in human society. So we know earlier on there were agrarian societies, there were hunters and gatherers, there were people who depended on uh, various uh, other forms of societies. And, and later on, we can see how uh, rural societies were formed and then urbanization occurred. So all these changes occurred in so many thousands of years. But there was a change keep, uh, keeping in view the nature of these societies in the law that were given. and. It was because of this that the Quran has said, "Likullin jalna minkum shir'atan wa minhaja wa lau sha'Allahu la jalakum ummatan wahida." We have ordained a law and assigned a path for each of you. Had God pleased, He could have made of you one community. So, a study of divine scriptures shows that the Sharia constitutes the major portion of the Torah, and the Hikma generally constitutes the Injil. So, a very, very interesting point. So, religion has two portions. It has two uh, uh, distinct parts. One is Al-Hikmah and one is Ash-Sharia. Now, if you look at the revealed scriptures before the Quran, the Torah primarily constitutes the Sharia part and the Hikmah primarily is something which the Injil is composed of. The Psalms, or as the Quran calls them, Zabur, revealed to uh, David, are hymns which glorify the Almighty and are a forerunner to the Hikmah of the Injil. Now, this is 
This is a fact that has to be understood that Hikmah is the thing that Jesus had brought forth in Injil and that is why he has, is reported to have said that I have not come to revoke the law but to complete it. So Torah was left bereft of that wisdom or that Hikmah which of course relates to morals and ethics. So it was that it was because of this that Jesus was sent and the Psalms as I just said were hymns to glorify the Almighty and they were basically a forerunner to the Hikmah of the Injil. Now, finally, you can say that the Quran was revealed as a masterpiece of literature comprising both Sharia and Hikmah, giving warning to those who evade it and glad tidings to those who follow it. The fact that the Quran is a blend of both Sharia and Hikmah is, is mentioned, I mean, in the verses that we have seen uh, earlier on, that it clearly says that uh, these verses clearly say that it is composed of uh, Al-Hikmah and Al-Sharia. Now, about the Torah and the Injil, about which we just said that one is composed entirely of law or a major part of it consists of law and the other which is in jail consists of a major part of it consists of al-hikmah. Now the, this is something which the Quran has specified and said that while narrating why, with one of the, his dialogues with the Almighty, uh, while narrating one of his dialogues with, uh, with Prophet Jesus uh, on the day of judgment, the Quran has actually said this, وَعَلَّمْتُكَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَالتَّوْرَاتَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ is in fact it is what is Allamtukal Kitaba, which means and when I instructed you with the Sharia and the Hikmah, that is the Torah and the Injil. So remember, this is what God is asking or telling Jesus. What is Allamtukal Kitaba wal Hikmah wa Tawra wal Injil? So remember when I instructed you with the Sharia and the Hikmah, which is the Torah and the Injil. So we can clearly see that here the Quran itself has categorized the Torah to be the law and the Injil to be the wisdom. So to sum it, we can say that Al-Hikmah basically consists of two things, faith and ethics. Faith and ethics. Hikmah, philosophy of religion, how we relate ourselves metaphysically and ethically to the Almighty. So that is what is called Al-Hikmah and it comprises of these two subtopics. So remember, once again, Al-Hikmah and Al-Kitab are the two basic contents of religion and Al-Kitab is also called Al-Sharia. So within Al-Hikmah, we have two subtopics and they are faith and ethics or beliefs and ethics. And as far as Al-Kitab is concerned, it contains or it consists of 10 topics. Al-Kitab and the sharia are the same. So these are the Sharia of worship rituals, the social Sharia, the political Sharia, the economic Sharia, the Sharia of preaching, the Sharia of Jihad, the Penal Sharia, the Dietary Sharia, Islamic Customs and Etiquette, Oaths and their Atonement. And if you recall that we have studied almost all of these topics separately and individually because we have done a major part of the Sharia or the Al-Kitab uh, that is mentioned in Ustaz Ghamidi's book. And uh, you would recall that these were the topics. So remember that if you can arrange them, then these are the topics that constitute the law part. The the law part or the Sharia part or the Al-Kitab part. So the important thing once again that we have to uh, understand here is that as far as uh, uh, the Quran is concerned, uh, it tells us that if you are to adhere to religion, then this is as far as the contents of religion are concerned. So one is Al-Hikmah, which consists of faith and, eth uh, and ethics or, or, or morality. And the other is a Sharia or Al-Kitab and it consists of the 10 topics that we just discussed. Now we come to the fourth topic of Ustaz Ghamidi's uh, overall understanding of the framework of Islam. And this is what we call the prophets and, his, and messengers. So the envoys of God uh, who brought this religion are called prophets. And a study of the Quran shows that besides being assigned the position of prophethood, which is also called Nabuwa, uh, some of them were assigned the position of messengerhood, which is also called Risala. Once, I would like to once again reiterate that God sent his envoys, his representatives, and they were called prophets or Nabi, or the plural is Ambaya. And another category or another cadre of prophets, a step higher, was the Rasul or the messengers. And they were a category above the, prophet, uh, the prophets. Uh, we'll just discuss the difference. But these were the two categories and they were sent primarily 
to guide mankind whenever there was a difference in religion. So, the Quran, of course, is, is something which describes this in detail. But let us see what Ustaz Ramadi has written when he was discussing or defining the terms of Nabuwa and Risala. So, he says, Prophethood means that a person, after receiving divine guidance or divine revelation, teaches the truth to his addresses and gives glad tidings of a good fate in the hereafter to those who accept the truth and warns those among them who reject it that a bad fate awaits them. In the terminology of the Quran, delivering such glad tidings is called Bashara. So Bashara is to deliver glad tidings and delivering such warnings is called Inzar, which is warning, of course. So basically what a prophet does is that he he gives glad tidings. He tells people that, well, if you are going to follow the truth, then you will be rewarded. And if you're going to not, not, not going to do this and you can you stick to your own uh, uh, attitude of vice, then you will be uh, you will be uh, taken to task and that is what we, we call our uh, is inzar and this is actually uh, described in the quran in a, in a quranic verse it says kana nas ummatan wahida fabath allahu nabiyyin mubashshirin wa munzirin mankind was once one community then differences arose between them so god sent forth prophets as bearers of glad tidings and as warners so you see basically uh, as the Quran has said, that this is something which happened in the history, in the course of mankind. When God created Adam, Eve, and the rest of their progeny, they were they were on a, in, on a single religion, and they were like one community. So the Quran says, "Kana nasu matum wahida." But later on, differences surfaced between them, and these were these were such grave differences that they were not able to resolve them amongst themselves. So God actually took this initiative, and He sent messengers. He sent prophets, in fact, who were warners and who were bearers of glad tidings. Mubashireen wa munzireen. So, Mubashireen and munzireen. So, this is something that we have to understand that basically this is what is meant by prophethood. That they warn us and they give us glad tidings. Next, Usaz goes on to define what messengerhood is. So, remember we just discussed that prophethood is, of course, a status occupied by prophets of God. And messengerhood, which is a cater above prophets it's like saying that all gods of all of envoys of all uh, gods envoys are uh, prophets it's like saying that uh, every person in an army is a soldier but there are some soldiers who become brigadiers or generals which means that uh, they become a, i mean they are not ordinary soldiers but they are cadet high so what we can say is that every soldier is a general but not uh, is not a general but every general is a soldier so in a similar way we can say that Every Rasul is a prophet, but not every prophet becomes a Rasul because that's a higher cadre. So, as far as uh, this is concerned, we have to uh, uh, understand that messengerhood means that a person is assigned to people, as I uh, said, such that he decides their fate through divine sanction, so that if they reject him, he practically enforces the sovereignty of the truth upon them by implementing on them God's judgment in this world. So you see, this is a very, very a glaring difference between prophethood and messengerhood. So prophethood or prophets of God, they just delivered God's guiding, uh, God's glad tidings and warnings. But the, a messenger, he takes a step forward on behalf of God. He actually decides the fate of his nation, the nation to which he is assigned in this world. And the Quran has actually formulated this as a law of Risala, and it has made no I mean, it has clearly mentioned this law at several places, but one place where you can see it being clearly mentioned is here in Surah Yunus, verse 47. It says, وَلِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولٍ فَإِذَا جَاءَ رَسُولُهُمْ كُوزِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْقِسْطِ وَهُمْ لَا يُزْلَمُونَ And for each community, there is a messenger. Then, when the messenger comes, their fate is decided with justice and they are not wronged. So, this is what we have to understand that the Quran, when it says that this is the law of Risala, then it mentions it very clearly that basically this messenger comes, that their fate is decided in this very world. At another instance, the Quran says, Indeed, those who are opposing Allah and His Messenger shall be humiliated. 
the Almighty has ordained, I and my messengers shall always prevail. Indeed, Allah is mighty and powerful. So this is another instance in which, in which this law is stated. Still at another place, we see that in accordance with this established practice about his messengers, it was ordained about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and it was said, it is he who has sent his Rasul with guidance and the religion of truth that he may make it sovereign over all religions of Arabia, even though these idolaters of Arabia may detest this. So the important thing is that messengers of God, they implement God's verdict. They create or set up God's court of justice on this on the face of this earth. All messengers of God did this, and this was the uh, this was the case with Prophet Muhammad also, who was the final messenger as well. So he also set up a court of justice. And the way this established practice about Risala manifests itself uh, is different. I mean, in, in, in basically there are different cases, and I'm going to also describe them. So the Almighty selects his messengers so that. Reward and punishment can be meted out in this world through them before the actual day of judgment. So, in other words, before that greater day of judgment, lesser days of judgment, they are set up in the life of every messenger. It becomes a miniature rehearsal. So, every lesser day of judgment becomes a miniature rehearsal of what is going to take place on that day of judgment, on the final day of judgment. These messengers are told that if they honor their covenant with God, they will be rewarded in this very world. And if they do not do so, they will be punished in this world. So it's, it's the promise that God has made with the messengers that they have to follow this. And the result is the very existence of these messengers becomes a sign of God. And it is as if their people can observe God walking on earth and these messengers with these messengers and delivering his verdicts. So on the basis of the signs of truths that have directly they, that they have directly observed, they are directed to propagate the truth and present the people with full certainty the very guidance of God the way they have received it. So they have to faithfully reproduce it before people. And in the terminology of the Quran, this dissemination of the truth, this bearing of witness of the truth before other people of the world or to their assigned addressees is called shahada. So the word shahada actually refers to this bearing of witness. And once this is established, it becomes a basis of the judgment of the Almighty, both in this world and in that to come. The Almighty grants dominance to these messengers and punishes those who reject uh, their, their message. I mean, they are, they, are, uh, they are totally routed. And for this very reason, Prophet Muhammad is also called a shahid and a shaheed in the Quran. So both these Terms have been used by uh, by the Quran for them. So we have the Quran saying, "Inna arsalna ilaykum rasula shahidan alaykum kama arsalna ila fir'auna rasula." O Quraysh of Mecca, we have sent forth a messenger to you to bear witness before you, just as earlier we sent a messenger to the Pharaoh. So you see, this is how the Quran has presented it, and this position of shahada was bestowed. Uh, besides other messengers upon the progeny of Abraham too. So remember this Shahada was bestowed individually to certain prophets who became messengers, but it was be also bestowed in the collective capacity on the progeny of Abraham, the Zuriyat of Abraham. And for this reason, the Quran has called them, the Zuriyat of Abraham, the progeny of Abraham, to be ummat -e wasat which means the intermediate group. Because uh, it, I mean, this group is between God's messenger and his creation. It is like standing in between them. On the one hand is God and his messenger, and on the other hand are their creation. So they are like a, a community in between them. And, they are, and it is asserted that they have been chosen for this position just as the Almighty chooses some great personalities among mankind and grants them the status of a prophet or a messenger. So remember this position of Shahada. You have to once again understand that it's not only bestowed upon individuals who become Rasuls, like Abraham and Noah and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, but it was also bestowed upon the progeny of Abraham, which we know are composed of the Israelites and the Ishmaelites. 
That is a detail that we'll be discussing later. But the complete progeny of, or the whole entire progeny of Abraham was bestowed with the status of Shahada. And the Quran has actually described this in Surah Hajj in these words, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِي هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جُعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ هُوَ سَمَّاكُمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَفِي هَذَا لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ and struggle for the cause of God in a befitting manner. He has chosen you for this responsibility and laid on you no burdens in the observance of faith. He has chosen you the, the way uh, he, is a, he has chosen for you the way of Abraham, your father. He named you Muslims earlier and in this period of the last prophet as well. So you see, clearly it seemed that it was chosen. I mean, in the name Muslim was something that was chosen earlier on and it was something in this last prophet as well. So it has been always the same. The word Muslim was used for the followers of this religion since the very beginning. So he named you Muslims earlier and in the spirit of last prophet as well. He had chosen you so that the prophet may bear witness before you and that you yourselves may bear witness to this religion before other people of this world. So, uh, I'm going to conclude here uh, with this uh, fourth topic of prophets and messengers with this uh, very important information that these Rasul or these messengers, they decide the fate of their nation in this world. And a lot of uh, uh, verses in which we, there's blood, bloodshed men mentioned or uh, a lot of punishments are mentioned for people who are to be punished for their, for their uh, denial of the truth people of the book and the idolaters, they relate to this law of Risala, the law of messengerhood, and they do not relate to uh, today's times, which of course is a very, very different, entirely different time. This is the post-prophetic period in which we are living, and in the prophetic period, in the period of God's messengers, this was a law in which the fate of every nation was decided in the lifetime of that messenger, and they constituted, this, this decision, this verdict constituted the, the, a rehearsal of the greater day of judgment. So that is why we can also call them miniature days of judgment that were made to happen in the lifetime of every messenger. So inshallah, we'll continue with this topic uh, in our later sessions. But uh, for, for now, we are going to conclude here and uh, I'll also invite you to have to ask any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Our first question asks, how should we reconciliate the essence of religion being al-ibadah with mm -hmm. another verse in the Quran that says, and verily we created life and death to test who among you does good deeds. You see, that is another thing. Uh, I mean, the verse actually tells us that this world the, the, has been created on the principle of trials and tests and not on the principle of reward and punishment. So the context here is that you're not going to live if you live a good life, you'll be rewarded in this life for your goodness. And if you live an evil life, then you will be punished for this evil in this world. So that verse is just telling us that what exactly is the nature of life in this world? Is it something in which we will be rewarded immediately for the good that we do? Or is it something else? So the Quran has outlined in that verse that this life is, a, is basically a place of test in which God has made us pass through various trials and the ultimate the verdict will be given in the hereafter, not in this world, in the hereafter. So that verse is basically describing the pattern of events in this world. Whereas this verse that we just studied uh, actually tells us what basically is the essence of religion, which means that we have to consider ourselves to be humble servicemen of God and not become arrogant and not become uh, independent creatures, so to speak, as Satan became in his own times and his progeny as well. So basically, it, it just tells us the place that from where we should behave. Our behavior should be as humble, down-to-earth people and not someone who are, who are arrogant and not someone who are haughty. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Currently, we, I don't see any more raised hands. Ruhi Rasul, I see you've unmuted yourself. Do you have a question? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Sir, we study uh, the terms philosophy and metaphysics um, uh -huh. in in literatures as well, right? Especially English literature and other literatures. How in uh, Quranic philosophy and metaphysics uh, are they different? 
uh, how so, can we differentiate between them so you see metaphysics is something that we call beyond physics or which is something in which you are connected to a realm which is beyond this world so physics basically are uh, is something which con- uh, which governs or which consists of the laws of this natural world and metaphysics is something which is beyond this natural world which is the realm in which we are connected to god in which we have a certain connection with god so metaphysics when we talk about metaphysics uh in, in in religion we actually refer to how we are connected to god on the basis of our relationship uh, of being uh, in connection with him either through our behaviors or through our attitude so that behavior and that attitude is something uh which when it relates to this world it becomes the sharia and i mean or or it becomes something which relates to the to our own human beings in this in this horizontal plane but when we connect ourselves vertically to a being with whom we have to have some 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 connection which is beyond this this world which 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 crosses the boundaries of this world that is where the quran or what we can make you understand by saying is that this is what we call the metaphysical and the ethical basis in other words uh your your belief system if if i can boil it down your belief system and your moral system these are the two things which are represented by the metaphysical part that we just discussed beliefs and morality beliefs and morality because you see belief is something that connects you with god at a plane in which you are i mean going beyond this world similarly morality is something which connects you with god in which you are crossing this world and making this effort that well this is how god has made us uh, connected to him that we have to be morally upright not only before god but to other people as well abdur rahman you're up next please go ahead assalamu alaikum sir well sir um, uh, you mentioned about the term service right uh, can you mm-hmm. please uh, explain in a little more detail what mm-hmm. what is meant by service because when we hear the word service we mm-hmm. think it is kind of a job or something that we have to mm-hmm. do following uh-huh. things of course not and we so will see, get paid here or something yeah. like that. i mean that is just a that because of the lack of a better word uh, because generally the word abd or abudiya is translated in the english language as serv- serv- servants of god so abdullah is generally sent, uh, uh, generally translated as uh, as a servant of god so that gives a different picture so here basically what is meant is a person who is humble and meek and does not consider himself to be a rival of god someone who thinks that i am all in all he acknowledges his place as a person who is humble and meek before the almighty so this is what is meant here that you must recognize what your position is you are not an independent person who is like self created or you have you can do anything that you want but the thing is that you must recognize that you are god's creation you have a very limited limited power and strength you must acknowledge that there is someone else who has the ultimate power and strength so in other words it keeps us in our place by telling us that our our purpose of creation uh, of course is that we must understand that we are creature we are creatures who have been created and therefore we must understand our limitations and must not cross those limitations to become arrogant as satan became so remember we started this verse earlier on that we have to be humble and we must forsake tahut so that is the opposite of uh, of uh, being humble that we become so arrogant that we become tahut that we become uh, i mean become satan personified so basically when it is said that you have to be servants of god or you be into in service it basically tells us that our connection with god or our relationship with god is someone or our, our people that we must realize that we have our limitations we are humble we have we cannot cross those limits and there is another being to whom we are answerable to who has created us and who is who has the status of being called the almighty so basically this verse is meant to describe us or describe to us that we must keep ourselves in check and in the position that we have been created we are not all in all god is all in all but we be, we try to become when we try to become all in all we become tahut and that is what we should not become so basically uh, ubudiya is the opposite of tahut as we have just studied 
So if you are able to understand this, that it, this verse is meant to tell us our position. Uh, it cuts us to size, so to speak, and it, it describes us what we should be like not become arrogant, not think that we have the absolute and the final word, but be in that humble position that we are creatures of God. Sir, can I, can I ask a follow-up on that? Yes, sure. Uh, sir, uh, usually it's said that arrogance is looking down on others. So, mm -hmm. in here, the person is not competing and gets caught, right? Maybe somebody scammed him and he is looking down on that person and he has a valid mm -hmm. reason to look down on that person. So, he is still, uh, I mean... Would he be still considered no, arrogant? I mean, you see, when you rise against God, I mean, we are talking about that uh, that rebelliousness or the, the level of Tawut in which you are become a rival of God. In which, I mean, like, for example, people start creating God's rivals, which is the biggest thing that you can do, that you create his, his peers. You say that, well, we have other deities as well. So this is one of the, I mean, this is the ultimate form of arrogance in which you uh, create God's peers. But the arrogance that you are talking about is something which actually is some is like a mutual behavior between human beings. So no, here it, the, the stress is against God that you have to realize that okay. God has created you as subservient, as individuals who have their limitations, and you must not not rise against God. You must not present yourselves to be people as if they have you have control of everything. Okay, sir, understood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Visma, please go ahead. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Sareem. Uh, so my question is, is the progeny of uh, uh, Hazrat Ibrahim just his direct descendants or all Muslims? No, no, his, his direct descendants. So the, remember, they are, they are two, the Israelites and the Ishmaelites. So Abraham had two sons, Isaac right. and Ishmael. So their descendants are his progeny. So we know from history that the Israelites were given this position of, uh, of Shahada first. When they did not fulfill it, they were deposed. And then the Ishmaelites were given this position when Prophet Muhammad was born or he was uh, called to prophethood. So if there are any descendants still left of them, yes, like descendants, it's their responsibility, not, not the entire Muslim race. Is that how it is? It is their responsibility, but the, the other people are required to join them in the primarily it's their responsibility because it is the progeny of Abraham who were given this uh, responsibility. But people from other, I mean, uh, you can say lineages, they, if they, when they accept uh, faith, then they become part of them. It is like they become, they reinforce them. So primarily okay. it's their responsibility, but we, other people get included in that. So in other words, what okay. we can say is that if they are not fulfilling the responsibility and the rest of them are ready to do that, so they'll not be held answerable. But if they are there and still other people are not doing that, then they will be held answerable. Oh, can I ask another question? Do we have time? Yes, please. Uh, so, Ego when, uh, from what I understood, um, Muslim was the term that was to be used for be believers from the beginning. So, how did right. the Yehudi become Yehudi and the Christians become Christians? So, that is what the Quran has pointed out. That God gave this name uh, in the time of Abraham to his followers and instead of accepting it, uh, this name, they they actually uh, became the followers of their religion. And we know that uh, earlier on, for example, the Christians were never called the Christians, they were called the Nazarenes. So, and Jesus of Nazareth actually presented to them the teachings of Islam. And uh, uh, I mean, the scriptures don't fully reflect the word Islam, but uh, I'm sure there were parts of it that have been expunged or they have not been preserved, in which this word would have been clearly written there. So it was much later that these followers became uh, Jews and Christians or the followers of a uh, particular sect. Otherwise, uh, I mean, in their own times, Judaism was Islam per se. I mean, what I'm saying is that if you extrapolate Judaism back to the times of Moses and uh, Christianity right. back to the times of Jesus, then uh, whatever Moses brought to them and whatever Jesus brought to them was nothing but Islam. So we don't, do we know what Judaism means? Yehuda means no. Of course, don't. Yehuda was the, the was the son of, of, of one of the sons of oh, Jacob. Oh right, they're, they're, okay, Yehuda, ah. that's right, Israel. Right? One of the sons of Jacob. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you so much, Doctor Sleem. Thank you, Doctor Sleem. The next question asks: Your good self refers to a verse that if God wished, He would have created you as one ummah, so He sent unto you Nabi and Rasul. Kindly mm -hmm. explain: Does this mean we humans mm. cannot be one right. ummah? 
Okay, so uh, that's a very good question because the verse that uh, was just cited earlier on uh, basically has been explained by another verse uh, at another place in the Quran in which the word Fakhtalafu appears that says that uh, mankind was created and then they started to differ with one another. So that is uh, found at another place. So it tells us that when mankind was created, the Almighty gave them that initial knowledge, which of course was given to Adam and it was passed on from him to his progeny. But then there were differences that arose that could not be resolved amongst themselves. I mean, they started to fight with one another. Blood, I mean, was lost and they were killed. So now God thought that uh, messengers and prophets, just as Adam was a messenger uh, as a prophet, so a further envoy, his, his representative is needed because the nature of the, those differences had become so pronounced that now individually people would not have been able to settle them. And uh, exactly what happened or what was, the, what was the nature of those differences, we don't, uh, we don't have details. But we do have details of what happened later on. For example, earlier on when Moses was given the book, so we know how the Jews of those times later on became divided amongst themselves. And those divisions were multiple, one after the other. And then Jesus was sent to actually, I mean, once again, regroup them and tell them that, well, they have been not discharging their duties properly. And at the same time, they have, uh, they have also uh, created divisions among themselves. So if you look at their sects, it will give you a whole, uh, I mean, whole saga and a whole account of what had gone wrong from the time of Moses and later on that had to be set right later on. Similar was the case with Jesus. If you look at the followers of Jesus, they split up into various uh, groups and sects and they became involved in such great controversies for example that Jesus regarded to be the son of God that the holy trinity was invented that people could not resolve this amongst themselves so the Quran was revealed as the final book in which it had to pronounce from God that there is no such thing as trinity and that God is one so these were the major differences that we can think I mean that are before us that I can tell you but if you ask me that what happened in the time of Adam uh, or later on that uh, that actually occasioned that uh, God's prophets and messengers can be sent. We don't have those details, but what we can see or what we can imagine is that there must have been very grave differences, like, for example, Trinity that we know of, like, for example, the calf worship incident that was mentioned in the times of Moses and other things that uh, that had to need, that were, for, for whose uh, reformation God's interference was necessary and he interferes through his messengers. Thank you, Dr. Sleems. Sanya Amir, you're up next. Please go ahead. Hello, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, sir, you have uh, said that um, uh, the religion has two parts. One is uh, al kitab and one is al hikmah. And hikmah right. means uh, morality. And mm -hmm. uh, the morality part. Uh, and morality and change. faith. Two things. Uh, hikmah Ma means okay. morality and faith. Morality and faith. And it uh, remained constant and it uh, never changed right. uh, in the times of right. all prophets. So what right. about uh, uh, Prophet uh, Adam uh, We believe that uh, in his times uh, um, uh, there were marriages between, you see, uh, the brother and the sister. And that's how the, uh, uh, you know, the mankind expanded right. or... So, yes. so, but uh, in uh, in the mm -hmm. times of uh, later prophets, uh, it was uh, to have marriages among. Right. Uh, so siblings. basically, th this part of religion is not morality; it's Sharia. To to wed someone belongs to the Sharia part. No, I mean it is. Uh, but the yes, what happens the, is that the, the, the whenever some, mm -hmm. you see, every Sharia starts off with some moral thing, and when it is prescribed with certain limits. It becomes Sharia. So basically, the Sharia springs from morality, and morality is something which is let loose, so to speak. But when limits and bounds are prescribed for certain uh, moral values, then they become the Sharia. So basically, marriage is something that is part of the Sharia. If you look at the division of social Sharia, you will see that marriage with uh, marriage itself, uh, who are prohibited for marriage. Similarly, what are the requisites of marriage? Who you can marry? Who you cannot? So this is basically part of the social Sharia of Islam, and that relates to the Sharia part. It originates from, of course, morality, but it actually has to be classified there. So that is why we see that this has evolved. As you have rightly said, initially, uh, brothers and sisters, they were allowed to marry. And it was mm -hmm. only when the family system became strong that this 
a prohibition was in place. Initially, the only prohibition was that of marrying your parent. So you could not have married your parent or grandparent. That was the original prohibition. And later on, as families developed and it was essential to, uh, to uh, safeguard family values, that these prohibitions were incorporated. But as I said, that this is basically part of the Sharia, not mm -hmm. the Hikmah. Because incest uh, is uh, considered to be a part of morality. It is very immoral. Uh, so now. that is what I'm saying. That yeah. incest is something that in, in its nature is called uh, uh, something which is immoral. So as I said, every Sharia mm -hmm. originates from morality. But when it is mm -hmm. when it prescribes certain limits, for example, mm -hmm. in, in morality, we would say that you should not have extramarital relations. But when mm -hmm. a person commits an extramarital relation, then how should we deal with such a person? What is the punishment that should be given to such a person? So that becomes part of the Sharia. So whenever morals, they are prescribed certain limits and given certain bounds, then they become the Sharia. Thank you very much, Dr. Slim. That was it for all of the questions today. Inshallah, see you tomorrow in another session of textual study of the Quran. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Take care, everyone. Thank you.